Hunt 41 is a celebration of American waterfowl hunting. The 41 species of ducks and geese are the roadmap for us to tell the stories of the various regions, styles of hunting, and most importantly, the people that are representing this great pursuit of ours. This is the original series, The Chase for the 41. How you doing? How you doing? Justin. Right. Justin, nice to nice meet you. Nice to meet you, Larry. For cameras this weather, but I think it's going to be good for the duck shooting. Yeah. Just hoping that the bluebills can, the bluebills cooperate. We're well, definitely going to shoot some brand today. Okay, we're going to go hunt with the guy in the little grass bowl with five horse motor. And, uh, stay like that. Probably Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably me because those are filled. I like to fill them for you. <laughs> now, we got, now we get to make a 24 foot boat disappear. <laughs> it should not, it should Bert shouldn't even see us against this backdrop today. So, be surprised how well this boat hides. It's kind of like a giant layout boat. And then, and then I got another. Can you just hand me that, Ben? Okay. The main thing is just to break your outline. Because it, I'm not really worried about the divers. It's just in case the geese decide to give us a work or the puddle box. You know? In the patch between the, I'm hoping they do it there with the way the wind is. The bill should suck up into the, you know, into the mass. I got a tail out. I might, if I have to, pull some bills a little more this way if I have to open a hole. They might actually do it right here, depending on, you know, the wind right now is a little more east southeast. It's supposed to switch to more east northeast, which we're blowing straight out. So we'll see how it goes. But they're going to come. Most of the birds should come straight around this corner and right down the edge here. This is this is their flyway to get their muscle beds are up by the houses up there, and there's muscle beds here too, so they'll, they'll, if they see the decoys, they should convince them to do it right for us. Pretty. I'll go over there. She knocks along pretty good. I uh, I had my phone out one day. I was fooling around just to see how fast we were going. And uh, she does 32 miles an hour flat out. It's like, it's getting to be like a dinosaur like me. You know, it's going to fight. <laughs> because uh, there's not too many of them left, I'll be honest with you. It's built out of, it's built out of plywood. It's got a one inch bottom. Uh, I put the sheets of plywood across the beam with the resource and all glue, and then it's bolted. It's got oak, oak runners on the bottom. This skiff here, my father built it in 1965 with his buddy, and uh, you know they've had to do. You know you have to replace ribs because they rot, and uh, this is a wood boat. It's uh, wood over fiberglass, 24 foot. This thing will go through rice. It's better, better than a duck water. I will, I will set. This is my, my my work boat, one of my gunner boats. And it's probably the best boat I own. I love this boat. I love this boat.
they call them a garvey. There's not too many of these garvey work boats left anymore because uh, <clears throat> all the old timers like myself, everybody used these boats for clamming and eeling. Kennedy Airport, the Twin Towers, little subway trains going that way, right? Put hat, you see anybody? Just me, you, him, and old John. Because I'm a part of this bay, same as the ducks and the water and everything else. It's like a lost world out here. They say the second largest winter area from the same border in New Jersey is the number one. We had this spot we called Slaughter Point in Jamaica Bay. And we'd go down there with two of these boats like this. They were only four feet wide by 16 feet long. And, and we had a lot of Oriental orders. And sometimes we'd shoot 150, 200 of them brant in a day. And we had every Chinese restaurant, hand laundry, you name it, bought for, from us, you know, in the winter. That's what we did. The biggest obstacle we had was the goddamn shells were paper hulls. And I used to carry dowels with us because you'd shoot and, the, and it wouldn't eject out of the gun. They swell up. Yeah, the take the, the dowel and drive the damn shells out of the gun all the time, you know? <laughs> what the hell? They were only a couple dollars, two, two fifty of a box of 25 back then, you know? We had shit gloves, we didn't have clothes like you got, you fellas have, you know. We used to have fill our boots full of, we'd pluck the feathers out of the breast of the ducks, you know, and stuff them in our boots, you know, to keep our feet warm. That's probably why I got arthritis in my hands today from that shit, you know. <laughs>
great thing because, you know, like Larry, I'm proud of as hell of him because all he ever wanted to do from the time he was a little guy was go shoot ducks. And I think it kept him away from drugs, drinking, all that kind of shit. You know what I mean? I well done, guys. No problem. You guys that was fun. awesome. Had more than fun. Fun. Totally awesome. Awesome. The brick park was built in 1780, and it replaced the house that George Washington was born in. William Augustine Washington was, one, was George's oldest nephew, and ended up inheriting uh, Wakefield, Haywood, and Blenheim, the, these three farms that comprised the Washington uh, land here. Across the hedgerow here that, you know, I was, killed my first duck or green wing teal in it. Right over here? Yeah. Wow. And well, that's pretty neat. Um, you know, that's where my dad started taking me duck hunting. <laughs> The property we're on right now was bought in like 1680 or so by George Washington's grandfather. And it's been in the family ever since then. We're descended from that line of Washington's. The land's been in the family uh, continuously since the late uh, 17th century. Yep, we have to do this about once every year to completely rearrange our setup. Uh huh. I think <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of reasons to put that out, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> you know, uh, George's grandfather was the, the first uh, Washington immigrant here. It's, it's sort of, you know, there's a lot of heritage, a lot of history. There's a lot of Aboriginal history on this property. There were Indian tribes here that just lived off of oysters and fish. They're coming back around. <laughs> Oh, that was fine. I don't think anything else got got hurt on that pole. Heel, heel. What? It was in my grandmother's attic in that house. You know, at, at up from the field we were hunting in. It's loose. It was shot to pieces. That it, it's the bores are rusted out, but it's a cool gun. Yeah, take a look at it. And, and it handles well for being so uh, barrel heavy. 
Yeah. <laughs> I guarantee that that gun shot a lot of geese and probably canvas back there. Okay, sit, sit, cut, back. Good boy, okay, sit, back. Good boy, heel, heel, heel. Hey, 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 hey. It's wild to think that they were probably all hunted this as well. George yeah. Washington most likely hunted out Oh here. yeah, yeah, and actually uh, a Washington historian that I've been dealing with lately, um, he remarked that the, uh, ar the archaeological sites that Washington's have occupied have a high percentage of game in them. And as you'll see when we get up to Blenheim, you'll, uh, Wade has cooked goose and there's probably venison. And, but, uh, so evidently they were, they were hunters all through the generation. Worked out pretty good. It took a whole hind quarter off a, a yearling, um, cured it, and then rubbed it with like marjoram, cayenne, uh, white pepper, a couple other spices, and smoked it for about eight hours. Goose, that's from last season. So plucked it, took the neck out, and then we made a uh, goose and dewy sausage with the uh, thigh meat, and then stuffed it back in there instead of using a hog casing and we're just gonna bring it up, slice it real thin, so you get that crispy goose skin, and it's full of goose meat. You know, I grew up eating a lot of, you know, very fantastic food my parents made, and they had a restaurant, and I worked in that quite a bit. Uh, mostly avoided cooking, honestly. I don't know, just being exposed to new foods and different foods I hadn't tried, like kind of reinvigorated, um, I guess, my culinary curiosity. And, you know, that kind of led into the hunting. You know, I was like, I wanted to get my hands on food that you couldn't buy. You know, that was like one of the biggest motivators. It was like, I want to eat food with a lot of story and, you know, something that I'm involved with and fits my ethos on sustainability and sourcing and all of that. It just kind of like, fit real nicely. I was like, I'm gonna go get my own animal protein and I'm gonna cook it and it's gonna be delicious. Why does it taste the way it does? What has it been eating? You know, where does it come from? Like, you get this like terroir, you can kind of taste the story of the animal, I think. And that's like why I really love wild food. It's like, it's, you know, from the mushrooms to the birds, the, you know, the pawpaws, the autumn all the stuff we pick up off the ground or shoot or store-bought proteins for me just don't do it three down or two three. we can sit down and have dinner like this was from this hunt and i remember exactly how cold it was or how much my waders were leaking or whatever it was you know it's like you have all these memories wrapped up in it and i think that's that's something missing i think from uh you know from food it's like so readily available you know, it's just kind of disposable. Like we forget how fundamental food is, you know, to our very being, you know, like we need it. There's not a lot of, where did this come from? What's the story behind it? You know, what did it take to be here? So these birds uh, plucked and then I stick an air compressor under the skin, puff them up, separates the skin from the meat and that way it lets it dry out a little bit. Stuffed them with uh, five spice, Jalapenos, serranos, red chili flake, and ginger. Let them dry out in the fridge for a couple days. And now we're gonna roast them. 20 minutes, take them out, let some of the fat drain, take the marinade out, and then roast them again. Let them drain again, and then we're going to just like finish them off with a bunch of hot oil to get that skin really crispy. You guys are awesome.
good work, team. We set long strings with 10, 15 traps on a string. And when we stack them in the boat. Right. My next, my pots are right here by the bridge. So. They got to be in sequence because once I throw the first exactly. one, it starts steaming out. They come, you know, they jump out. So he gave me the wrong one one day and another one from over there came, just almost took my head off. And I said to him, what the fuck? And he goes, listen, one thing, old boy, all I am is a reflection of you. And I remember that the rest of my life. I thought that was funny shit, you know? <laughs> Ten years from now, that this may not even be an acceptable living in this area. Like, no one will be left. I tell people on commercial fishermen that they're, they're this is my target species. These are called uh, Atlantic rock crabs, but the fishermen call them white crabs. That's what they use for black fishing bait. These are green crabs, these are a money crab. This is the dreaded spider crab. And you know why they're dreaded? Because see what they do? They get inside my throat, get stuck, and they don't let anything else get into my trap. They work, they work they're worthless, you know? And we also have hermit crabs in here too, which are worth money. These sell for a dollar each. See the hermit, see how he's tucked in there? That's like blackfish crack to the black, the black fishermen, that's why they will pay. The pay isn't that great, but... You get all the advantages of being a fisherman, being free, being able to be with my father. And I'm always with my father, you know, if we're, if we're working, we go hunting together, we go fishing together. It's a great thing in itself, you know, me and him have a you know, really tight bond and basically lost without each other. And I never came into this expecting to get rich. I, I always came into this with the you know, expectation that if I can pay my bills, in the future feed my family, and buy the things that, you know, have money left over to get a few things that I want, I'm a happy man. We're gonna go back and uh, try to get on some more bills and hope that the brand cooperate today and they don't, they don't go all run inland to get out, you know, get away from the bay. But I think with the, uh, the wind dropping out and it's getting nicer, I think uh, we'll see the bills respond, the brand respond a little better today. So, and then hopefully uh, if we whack out, you know, the bills and brand quick, we'll go and try to get some squaw and maybe do a black duck jump shoot. What's going on, man? You guys come here to Long Island and shoot mallards. You're not supposed to shoot mallards on Long Island. The guy in Oxo would be creating his pants for that. You know, my grandfather, my, my grandfather, he kind of got, he kind of did the commercial fishing to supplement his income back in, you know, the hard days, you know, he used to drive a truck back, you know, I guess in the 40s there. And then, uh, but my father actually started out as a garbage man. He wanted, is my, my, my grandfather wanted him to be a garbage man. So he went to that job, but he, he wanted to be on the bay. He stopped being, because he'd be a garbage man, work and work and work, and he wanted to be out on the bay. And finally he just said, you know what? And he went full time with it. And what I do is, you know, I don't have a mortgage. I don't have, you know, my taxes are what they are. I have to pay them or not. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing. But I know friends of mine whose taxes, the taxes alone, like to live there, just to live there, you know, so. They don't have the time to go out and run around on a Friday afternoon and try to find the birds for Saturday morning. So they just go. It's a reason to get together with your friends and celebrate life and not just, you know, not just, you know, kill birds. It's daily. Some guys just miss that. You know, they really miss that. Just being out here with your friends, your family, take some birds and, and go home and cook them and have, you know, have a lot of laughs in the process because that's one thing you'll, you, you saw. Me and Adam and my crew, we... Never end, we, as our motto is always an adventure because everything we do, it always turns into an adventure.
historic home on historic land and predates a revolution and we're goose hunting, duck hunting and we're sharing wine and eating food and it's like this is really what about like the hunting culture is for me it's like it's so much coming together you know we we all love what we do we love chasing birds but like this is it you know your, your friends sitting around eating drinking hanging out like this is as good as it gets I think honestly <laughs> Yeah, well, they used to chase us on motorcycles and every other damn thing, you know what I mean? Because we used to hunt on Kennedy Airport back in the day. Yeah, he had, nobody. He had, was... a, he had a blind on the actual airport. I had a pit. I had a. That now, forget about it. Be like. <laughs> I had a pit. I had a pit blind up there. The ducks would come up and over that berm, and you were in that pit blind. They were like right there in front of you. It was like. Right now, I, I think most people that work on the water are endangered species. From all of us at Hunt 41, this is American Waterfowl.